I see a question at the back. Just uh, the way I understand is what you're saying is the identity policy uh, or the concept of identity is correct, but the way it is implemented is wrong. Um, so I'm looking at it not from the UK perspective, I'm looking at it more from the yeah. India perspective. Let's nuance the, the idea, what I what I'm hopefully was trying to say was that the idea of having a ways of identifying people, and I would say particularly birth, birth registration, is a very important feature for the inter- thing. Yeah. I think you've got perspective, okay? In India, the identity policy is subsidy. Last year, this is the fiscal year which ended in March, we had about 4.5% of the GDP spent in subsidies. Since 1947, when India got out of the British rule, yep. all the great <coughs> yep. testing and all that, we have been running poverty elimination programs. None of the poverty has gone. Only the people who started the poverty elimination programs, their poverty probably has gone. Mm-hmm. And Okay. Today, I have a Mercedes Benz, a diesel Mercedes Benz, and I'm getting the benefit of very subsidized fuel. Nobody wants to raise the price of the fuel yep. because they don't say, oh, no, no, the yeah. fuel is all. So who's getting the benefit of it if you look at the thing? So that's the reason. Okay. The community program is for those kind of things. The larger thing. Okay. The second thing. Let me, let me. Program. Let me just yeah, yeah. I think the perception there was wrong. The UID program has nothing to do with the KYC and anything of that. The UID program is just going to guarantee X Mr. Manmohan Singh, who is standing in front of me, is Mr. Manmohan Singh. Just three states, three states in India, by implementing the UID program, have got the benefit. In India, the PDS, the public distribution system, the fraud in PDS is about $20 billion. The fraud. Yep. Out of that, 60% of the fraud is because of duplication of records. So, my name. Samir Desai, mm-hmm. okay, I exist in 25 places. Yep. Some places I exist as a below poverty line person, I get mm-hmm. subsidized ration. Yep. Correct? Now, one state just implementing this reduced their public distribution bill by 60%. The total cost, the total cost of UID project is not an astronomical cost. Because what we are doing is just the UID project. Yes, we do a comprehensive system. Okay. okay. So okay. The presentation is pretty wrong somewhere. Okay. okay. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer the question. Uh, My question is, so what you are telling us the UK experience is about? No, I'm, I don't have a question. I'm just trying to. Yeah, fine. Okay. okay. And the government is. That's fine. Okay. 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 If I can, if, I'm happy to. Take the question. I'm happy to defer to an expert on PDS uh, who can, who was, I think, will, will want to respond in terms of the, the, the figures. Let's just think through the practicalities of the subsidised fuel. I am not aware at the moment of any intention to roll out to petrol stations, to fuel stations, a biometric reader, whereby every time you wish to purchase fuel, you will present your fingerprint, it will then be checked against the central database. The current, uh, again, uh, this workshop I was at, the current turnaround time is about 10 seconds end to end for that transaction. So you want to get on with your life, it's taking 10 seconds for the system to come back and say, the fingerprint that we hopefully have matched says that you well, actually, it doesn't. It just says that you are a, a, a person. It do, currently, doesn't link it to your tax status. So that's, or, that's stage version five. Okay. 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 We are stopping people at stage zero. Allow me to moderate. Allow me to moderate. Okay. Let's let's have let's not have a one. Let's not have a one. Yeah. Let's not have a one. No, I agree. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Something is right. Sorry, sir. I mean, one is just a line. Yeah, thank, thanks, Samir. Come in, come in. Please come in. No, please come in. No, take your mic. Ah, no, no. 
I would really like if you just ask a specific question. No, I don't know. What's wrong with you? Once again, please allow me. Please allow me. Please allow me. Just ask your question. Allow him to respond. Let's not have interjections. Okay, my thing is, what is the main objection to the UID project that you feel? Is it the way it is implemented? Or is it that we should not have an IID project? I don't think you objected to the UID project. Now, my, my concern is, and I'll come back to the mic, the, oh, I don't know enough about the detailed operations. I am simply based on what I have heard and have read about, is I am not aware of any PDS systems at the moment using the biometric based UID, because it has to be the biometric, because just giving a number is not going to do any checking, is actually leading to uh, a wholesale reduction in fraud. It might be, I'm not aware of it. I'm also not aware that the multiple recipient fraud is the greatest proportion of the fraud. But this is where experts who study this area have their own more detailed evidence to, to provide. So that's, I don't know. I suspect that it's not as huge as you are uh, indicating it is. And I am, shall we say, perplexed as to how this is already stopping this from happening. Because as far as I'm aware, it's only been the enrollment process. I'm not aware of any significant rollout of online verification services. And even if that were to be the case, I'm certainly not aware of any secure online verification services. Because if I wish to do, if, if you are my friend and I wish to do the fraud, then I accidentally kick the power supply out when you present your fingerprint and it comes back and, and it doesn't come back oh, and, uh, we, we assume that you're okay and we'll give you the food at that particular point so if you want to have you have to make sure that every single transaction is a verified transaction and that is a huge step up which will increase the costs and I'm not aware, and I, I, I'm happy to be correct. One of the reasons for coming is to learn more and to, you're wrong on this and you, it's a differing interpretation, etc. I'm not aware that that is happening at the moment. So therefore I would be surprised, pleasantly surprised, if it is having those kinds of effects. That's the intention, fine. My question becomes, how do you get to that intention? And what are the risks all the way along the route of how that desirable intention of reducing benefit-related fraud is addressed, and whether that really is the core of the problem that needs to be, that should be a focus for significant government activity. That's the, that's the, as it, as it, I'm going to fall back to being an academic. As an academic, those are the interesting questions. And my understanding is that the evidence is not yet there, that the problem is of that nature and that the solution is having that effect. If it is, fantastic, I'll shut up. If the evidence is not there yet, that's something that needs to be studied and I, I look forward to hearing more about it. This is one where I really can say, as someone in the UK who's been here for five days, I really don't have an answer uh, to that particular one, I'm afraid. how you act uh, about that. I mean, I think, so again, so kind of coming from my academic, academic background, the interesting question is, OK, so you've got these, these intentions, these desires. There's talk about different government departments starting to inc include UID as one of their identifiers. 
just to see how much is actually being done, when is it being proposed, what kind of coverage is, what kind of benefits, what kind of costs to benefits. So separate from money being spent irresponsibly, which is technically a kind of budget oversight kind of issue. Let's assume that they are spending it in the right kinds of ways. What are the plans for the next stages of the scheme? What are the plans whereby the kinds of benefits that the previous speaker was hoping for are going to be, become? How are they going to be uh, delivered? Again, when we were in discussions with the UK, I, there was one particular event where I was on the same panel as the, 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 the lead administrator for the program. And one of the questions that I asked was, there is currently, as far as I'm aware, no plans for card readers so that you could actually use the card online to prove your identity. What is the time scale? Not how many have you got, but what is the time scale for rolling those out? Is it going to be a year? Is it going to be two years? He didn't have an answer. They hadn't even thought about that next stage because at that point they were just interested in giving people cards. They hadn't thought about the next stage of the benefits for the individual. And that then gets a real concern from industry. Industry is saying, you're promising us this, but you haven't even given us the technical specifications for saying how we can access the documents, the, the verification services or whatever. We haven't, you haven't told us what level of accreditation we need to, to achieve to be allowed to use that service directly to know whether or not you have, in the UK case, an ID card or, or, or not. So again, what are the equivalent mechanisms in place for rolling out the use of UID in these different scenarios? And if there isn't, if there aren't plans for those kinds of things, that's when you need to start asking the question. So we've done all of this, but we haven't even thought about the next follow-on stages. Can't we? Think about getting those next follow-on stages getting sorted out. Yep. I think I had had this question where uh, when you were in UK and you were, they were, I mean, representing the card system there. So what were the inadequacies of the present identification system which led then okay, we need to get a Okay. Um, again, it would vary from government minister to government minister. Uh, it would vary according to their particular desires. Uh, uh, towards the end of the scheme, they were really concerned about young people, 18 to 21 year olds, uh, particularly going into bars, technically buying in those old-fashioned days when you used to buy DVDs from the shop kind of thing and you had to buy, you had to prove that you were over 18 to buy particular things. Uh, but particularly going into bars and nightclubs, there was a concern that because they've got very strict, you have to be over 18, which typically means if you look anything less than 25, they'll ask for proof of ID, which was a bit of an over uh, char characterization. The story was that they, that particularly women, would bring their passport as a proof of ID and they would either leave them at, on the floor in, in the, the kind of corner of the nightclub at the end of the night because they had too much to drink and it had fallen out of their handbag or they put it in their shoe which was not a particularly desirable thing either or people use their driving license and the problem with the driving license is it in the UK is it also has the home address so you're a young lady going to a nightclub, there's somebody on the door who's a bit sleazy but quite likes you, asks are you over 18, you show them your driving license and that gives them your name, your date of birth, your home address, all sorts of unnecessary detail because the, logically the question are you over 18 has an answer that's either yes or no. It doesn't require, here is my full name, my place of birth, my date of birth, my home address, etc. In fact, the UK um, ID card had the full name, place of birth, date of birth of 
ev everybody. And because it was also intended to be used as a travel document, it was made, uh, it had to be printed on the front of the, of the cart. And the, home, the, the next Home Secretary, so not Charles Clark, another one, uh, when it was finally released, proudly displayed his identity card to the press. And the newspapers picked up uh, the photo of this and made a big thing saying about the British crown and the crest and whatever. But it also had his full name, date of birth, place of birth. In the UK, we have a good re register of births and you can request birth certificates online. The only three pieces of information that you need to give, full name, date of birth, place of birth. You can imagine what happens. Alan Arthur Johnson, May the 15th, 1952 from memory, born in London. Now if you're called Edgar Whitley and you come from a small town, it's pretty likely that there wasn't a second Edgar Whitley born in that town on that day. A second Alan Johnson born in all of London, it's not an unreasonable possibility. So I paid my £10, I applied online for a copy of his birth certificate, expecting a, which one of these Alan Johnsons is he? There's only one. In my office in London I have a copy of his birth certificate. Birth certificates in the UK also include a mother's maiden name. If you do online banking, typical security checks, date of birth, mother's maiden name. Not really a very smart idea to be giving all of that information available, particularly for the scenario of uh, just wanting to prove that you're over 18 so that you can get a drink. And there are very innovative technologies and I've been working closely with a, a company in the UK that uses biometrics. It uses biometrics, gives you a token, a card or whatever, or a chip in your phone. It stores a representation of your fingerprint on the chip. It stores the date of birth on the chip. And that's it. If you go to a bar, you put your phone on the card reader, you put your finger on the fingerprint, and it goes green light, red light, over 18 or not. It has to be my finger, so I can't give you my phone and you try to enroll. I always have my mobile phone with me because I'm sad like that. But there's no database, there's no tracking, there's no sent, the only checking that's done is when they issue the, the token to make sure that my date of birth really is my date of birth. But once I've done that, they have no further knowledge of whether I'm going to the bar every single day or only occasionally or hardly ever. Uh, wait, so, so, so in that particular case, it's stored on an NFC near-field communication chip, which could either be on a plastic card, so if you're traveling in London you get an Oyster card and it's on that. The newest generation of smartphones also have NFC chips on them, but obviously that's really expensive cutting edge. Or what they did as an intermediary was they just printed it onto a sticker, and you stick the sticker onto the back of your phone. So it's not on the phone, it's not in the phone, it's physically on the phone or on the phone's case. But as I say, it has date of birth, a code for your fingerprint, a little bit of technical detail about how, who issued it, and that's all. Nothing about your name, nothing about your address, because they don't need it. They just need to know, is today's date over 18 years after your date of birth or not? Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, do you see biometric registration, local registration? Yeah. Has okay. So, so, so there's a couple of different things going on. Yeah. So the first one is, uh, is simply that all the UID does is it gives you a number. Yeah. With a bit of checking, possibly if you have documentation and a deduplicate. Yeah, that yeah, but let's, for, for higher up in the pyramid, there will be some checking. So if effectively, all, and, and the, so then there's the question of whether the deduplication actually works, yeah. which is both a technical question about whether the technical mechanisms for, for deduplication actually work, but it also has a process question, because let's say that I have enrolled more than once, let's say that the system uh, under two names, and let's say that the system spits it out and says, we, we've already seen this fingerprint and iris for John Smith, and now they're claiming Edgar Whitley. You still need to have a process that makes sure that that application is rejected. So if I want to be a criminal, and I want to get lots of UIDs for, multiple UIDs for my friends, I just have to address that point of weakness that somewhere the system will say don't issue a UID because uh, they're already registered. Probably there will be a no, actually this is unique override. If you can address that weakness in the system, then I can give you three, four, but they'll all be linked to your biometric. So it doesn't actually, now I expect that UID is making sure that the people who have the ability to override and to reject aren't subject to the kinds of interference that, but that's a very serious risk. The second question, or the second part of your question was about whether or not biometrics are needed. And this is, I think, an area where the Indian case does reveal a very interesting feature. If you have no other documentation, then a way of linking the number back to the person does potentially become an important, valuable issue. I can't go along and say, look, look all over YouTube, you can find images of me that will give you confidence that it's the same person. You can't do, do that kind of capability if they have no or effectively no documentation. But then the next practical question comes, how are you going to do that? Assuming that that's what you want, how are you going to do that biometric verification? If you've had problems enrolling the person. If it's a bright sunny day and you're trying to do iris biometric and you've bought an iris scanner and logged it out to the field and you've got the power supply, the actual rechecking the biometric back against the person is a non-trivial task. It requires skilled staff. It requires good conditions. One of the reasons why iris biometrics are, have a, a flaky performance in modern airports it's because modern airports are designed by architects, and architects like light and bright open spaces. Iris recognition things want very controlled lighting arrangements. So you're going to always have practical problems. So there's the deduplication element, which is a technical question and a process question to make sure it actually works. And of course, you've got a scale problem in India where you're talking about a billion. Um, in the UK, the inventor of iris biometric technologies, so there's a certain element of bias there, argued that in the UK, just using fingerprints would cause lots of problems after about three or four million enrollments, in that the, the five millionth fingerprint would pick up too many, it might be X, it might be Y, or it might be Z that you'd have, a manual, have to have a manual process to make sure that it wasn't X, Y, or Z. Now that clearly won't be the people who are doing crime scene fingerprints. It will have to be somebody else, so more people. So he was... So, yes, to, 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 and he was saying that that would kick in a very low number, relatively low, few million people in the UK because fingerprints are not designed to be distinctive enough for deduplication over that scale. And lo and behold, he advocated iris biometrics as being much more reliable, although if you are the one billionth or the 600 millionth, which is the current figure that they're aiming for, person, you are checking that against 599,999,999 other irises 
because you, can't, you have to make sure that nobody previously has been done, and that computationally is going to be quite significant, and it gets worse the more you enroll. And even then, all you've done is we're pretty sure that this iris belongs to somebody within our borders, officially a resident, and we've given them a unique number. You've still got the, and now they come along six months, six years later, claiming that they have this particular number and want to prove, using their biometric, that it is the same, the same person. And that's going to be horribly complicated. What happens if they claim to be something and the system doesn't work or is it's too bright and sunny that day or there's connection problems? Do you err on the side of the, the individual or do you say, no, the system hasn't said yes, you are that person, therefore you don't get benefits, come back tomorrow and we'll deal with you at that point? That's the figures from the, the official oh, yeah. report. Yeah. So, so the first one is you have this idea of a best finger, the one that's most likely to work. And then the two best finger up to three attempts. 
and we're still only at 99% of a billion people are able to do this. Now, I, I struggle with billion people, but that's an, 1% of a billion is an awful lot of people who cannot use their two best fingers on three attempts to prove who they are. And this is based on, as, as, as Ram was saying, on a, a small scale uh, study. So the 93.5 was in the right story, the first one. That's a single best single one attempt. Okay. Uh, if you go to single best, the three attempts, it goes to 96.5. 99% means one crore are excluded. Right? And that's a huge number. Okay. And it's up to 3% two best singers. The most the fundamental issue here is if you, if you are going to use fingerprints as a fundamental identifying variable in your in, in, in your service search, okay? One who has a cut on his finger, one who works with chemicals, agents, all of them will have difficulties in authenticating those. Okay? I'm not looking at network breakdowns, etc. Like that. That's a completely different question out there. Okay? That's one. Women with memory is another uh, issue. Finally, fingerprints keep changing. Okay? As you grow old, fingerprints keep changing, particularly with manual workers, and your large number of studies from IT Delhi will show that. After, when you grow older, the, the time period within which fingerprints change comes down to something like one year to two years. Okay? So between one year to two years, you have to be enrolled. And in the meantime, you may have a lot of problems in authenticating yourself. Okay? And this is important because this question cannot be ducked by saying, oh, we have IRS. Because in no pilot study, in no service provision, is IRS being used as an authenticator. Everybody needs a fingerprint. Okay? If you are using fingerprint as the primary authenticating instrument of yours, okay, then you cannot run away from this level of these kinds of things. I tell you, this is an internal report. Okay, I take this internal report which has been a pinch of salt. An external lot is likely to be much more, uh, uh, much higher than the base. Okay, and this this much is for the is for the 15 to 16 pro people that UIDA has already enrolled. Okay, we don't know how much this will explode into. This elevator will explode into when you reach 100 pro. So, figure why? I think. I think, I think this project will fail under its own base and that they, the efficiency of uh, this project will be by I'm pretty sure going to write this book. Sorry. Sir. It's okay. I mean, and again, the interesting flip side of that is if you do have those kinds of problems, then potentially you don't bother with the biometric authentication which means that you're straight back to the, do we know who you are? Give us a number. That looks like a valid number. Yes, there, there's somebody with that name that has that number. And you've kind of, OK. And, and particularly because if you're targeting the uh, individuals without proper documentation, you have no other checks other than their introducers. Or, so potentially, it really unravels and that's and it's that how do you do this in practice at the level of that's when the really detailed questions become very very important because it's at that level of detail what happens if and I think the idea is that they'll tell you which are your two best fingers in case you forget uh, please put one of these two once twice three times still not recognizing you you, you look like you you're an Edgar Oh, just, just, just go and do it. Oh, let's not bother even doing it twice next time. So you've got great aspirations that are undermined by the practicalities of, of, of daily uh, operation. Just a small additional point. The reservoir committee probably knows this issue. For instance, uh, the first uh, UNI claimed that you Aadhaar would be adequate to be approved by the rest of the bank account. The RBI swiftly issued a circular, no, sorry. Even if the person presents the Aadhaar number, please go and check his address manually. Don't open an account without doing that. Be, 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 because opening a bank account 
has a particular level of risk and they have taken a risk assessment that says the level of guarantee for self-reported slash verified enrollment data is insufficient to address that particular risk, which is perfectly understandable. track. Uh, the question was, why is the government planning? I have no idea. I can't answer. No, I'm, I'm just giving you yeah, yeah. from your uh, UK experience. And, and last question, for example, going back to the slide which you had showed, how telecom can leverage. Yeah. For example, in India, the mass is kind of, you know, you go to buy a new SIM card, right? The moment you get it, you start using, from second day onwards, you start getting telecaller from that number. And then it's onus on the user to go to the website and then to register that I would not like yep. to get any calls. So do you think there's an infringement happening from the service provider who is already distributing that number? That, so okay. so uh, same, thing, same thing can be applied here. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, opt in versus opt out, which is essentially the, 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 the SIM number issue, is a really, I mean, if, you, if you've read uh, Nudge by Thaler and Sunstein, it's a very interesting one because any system has a default. Uh, they talk about whether you put healthy food at the front and unhealthy food where you have, particularly if you've got a big belly, you really have to reach to grab the unhealthy food, whether you put people into a, say, a, a, an insur a, a, a pension saving scheme by default and then they can choose it. So thinking about default values is very, very important. So somebody chose whether the default value when you get a new SIM is that you opt in to receiving marketing messages or you opt out. It would appear that the decision was that you have to opt out, which means that the numbers are freely available. That was probably a commercial decision with lots of lobbying from the phone providers saying this is a way that we can increase our revenue stream. We know that hardly anybody, anybody bothers to change their mind. Nobody's going to say, I'm going to go onto that website and, off, and, and tick the box that says I want to receive it. Uh, but that question about uh, decision choice is one that really should be informing the design of any kinds of things. So do you by default do this or do you by default not do that? That's a very, very important one. And my ultimate goal is that people have at least, I cared less about whether you opt in or opt out 
than whether or not you had a proper reflection on it and if it's a government policy that there's been transparency as to who's been lobbying and influencing that. So I'm much more, personally, I'm much more interested in the decision process by, by which that decision was made than particularly whether it was one way or the other, because I have a suspicion that if they're exposed and properly done, they tend to be more in favor of the citizen. Uh, back to the question of uh, federation, centralized. Realistically, I expect, but I don't know if there's any details of this, the, the lookup database that will provide the yes-no answers will be more than one single database. I would expect, I would expect it will be state based as a, as a, as a just as a, a logical practicality and if, so if you are here, you will check this state's uh, database first. If it doesn't find you there, not find you with wrong data, it doesn't find you because you're, you're visiting from somewhere else, then it will ping around possibly to places where there's migration patterns or whatever. So I expect that they will be federated in that sense, which means that you have less data in any one particular database. But then again, immediately the scale of India means that you've still got millions of records even in one particular uh, state. And then there was another question in the middle of your question too, which I've forgotten. The second question. Oh, oh yes, so. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I suspect that there's probably a few different things going on at the same time if the UK is anything to go by. The first one is that there are, as it were, private concerns about the quality of data in different government databases. So in the UK, you, in order to get benefits and to pay tax, you have to have a national insurance number. There are, I think the figure is something like 60 million national insurance numbers for 40 million working people. Now, a little bit of that can be allowed for because if uh, you are the widow of somebody, their, their national insurance number still has to be kept live because you're still receiving the, the benefit on, that they earned, but not at the kind of number. So the national insurance database is known to stink. It's just not good enough quality data. Um, that means that other government departments that perhaps want to have relatively secure data are not going, think it's easier to start from scratch than to copy somebody's database and then weed out. What the UK proposals are doing at the moment is actually something slightly different, which is using your existence in those different databases as a way of giving confidence. So if my mobile phone company wants to do an increased check on me, it might check whether I have a national insurance number. And it might check whether I have a voter electoral roll number. And it might check. But it knows that it's never going to be perfect. But if three good departments and one OK department all know about me, they're probably happy. So I suspect there's probably an element of interdepartmental politics going on. Why should we give our data to you? So the reason it's a, in the UK you actually have a, a tax number and a national insurance number. The reason why you have two different numbers is that the tax department was not prepared to pay for the lookup service from the national insurance numbers. It was not prepared to go along and say, here's a national insurance number, is this Edgar Whitley? They said, we'll just create our own number. So you get the real politique of dirty data, departmental squabbles, and possibly also a, this is visionary, this is forward thinking, we're using the state of the art in technology, we are developing and doing something that nobody else in the world is doing. So I suspect there's a, a number of different things going on that make, let's use an existing database but it's your existing database, or your existing database makes it very problematic for that to happen. Yeah, right? yeah I, I wouldn't copy the date, unless I knew that somebody else's database was really good, in which case, realistically, this problem would never arise, because everybody would just rely on 
the voter database or the tax database or the education database or whatever it was. So I don't think you'd ever be in that situation. So I wouldn't use somebody else's database. I would check against everybody else's database. But that only applies for the top two thirds of that pyramid. It doesn't work for the people who are not documented, for the people who've been given a voter ID card because it's got a female face and whatever. Because again, this is where the scale of India and the poverty of large parts of India just become such an overwhelming factor to the whole process. If you are a government doing this for, as it were, high integrity transactions, then the risks associated with that, because you have no enforcement mechanisms, are too high for. See, it would be interesting but astonishing if a you know who. You know and someone who knows someone, therefore you get a British passport to process where to work. Because the opportunity to game the system, I will pay, if you are a trusted introducer into that network, such that anyone that you introduce gets a British passport, the opportunities for you to be paid millions and millions of rupees to introduce non-friends becomes a, a, certainly a, a moral dilemma that you would face. So there is, there, 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 at that level, there is a very practical gaming of the system uh, concern, which I suspect is why governments are not rushing to adopt it. Uh, what you do find is very interesting social practices. So we were studying a, um, a website where criminals exchange details about phishing attacks and credit card details that they had uh, obtained and. Uh, Nets for attacking uh, machines, etc., etc. There, the reputation, there, the, the, the circle of trust really works. But guarantee, but but they have really sophisticated measures for making sure that you are completely trusted. And I suspect that if you turn out to be untrustworthy, the penalties are going to be far more severe than a state government would be allowed to do on a wide scale. So the model is very interesting. The elements of that have already existed. So for the British passport application, you had to get the photo signed off by a clergyman, a teacher, a civil servant, or whatever. But they don't just rely on that. They also rely on these other kinds of checks. So I suspect it will be part of that process, and we do rely on that. We do trust recommendations from people that we trust and the people we know. So if Ram says, this is a really good book to read, I'll read it. So it does work. But if he were to say, this is someone who you should lend 10,000 pounds to, I promise they will repay from Mumbai. By the way, I might not be coming to London for a few more years and don't need to visit LSE at that time. I might be a little bit more uh, skeptical, even though I would trust him on books to read, people to meet. So it, it's that, it, but it does force that what is the really the level of assurance that you require? What kinds of things would you trust them absolutely, probably, 
a little bit wary, but if everything else might, so it's, it's that broader way of, of, of looking. But I suspect that it's that level of trust that's required or level of assurance that's required that ultimately becomes too much of a risk for, 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 for governments to do at any kind of scale. The introducers. Have this introducer idea. Yeah. The problem is that it's been gamed, as you yeah. said, and it's been gamed so badly that it's, uh, it's one of the uh, you know, strike marks against you. Idea. The whole ministry has just said, you know, this process is completely out of the way, which it shouldn't be done at all. Yeah. Conversations we had with politicians of both political party, of both opposition parties, um, we know that they were that they were listening. I, I can give you examples where MPs stood up in Parliament and say, I, "I'm not think I'm not making these statements myself. I'm relying heavily on the LOC report." So, the political. Uh, drive of the two opposition parties was certainly helped by having, it's always helpful to have academic research that stands up and supports your argument. I think the political fight, the, the attacking of LSE, got awareness of the issues raised to a greater level. I think government losing the child benefit discs raised awareness. So I was kind of expecting when the benefit discs were lost, in a day or two I'd write an opinion piece saying, and you do realize that the government said that they would keep your identity data secure and we warned that it would be a problem. But no, within three hours, the press was already recognizing that there would be very practical implications for ID cards. So the press had got it. If Labour had won the election and the ID card scheme had then actually continued to roll out, I think then the question of the biometrics and the, the practicalities would have got to the situation where political upset from ordinary citizens would have increased and increased and it would have become increasingly unpopular and people would be writing to their MPs saying why am I being expected to present my fingerprints like a common criminal just to order to do X, Y or, or Z because fingerprinting has a very strong connotation with uh, cr criminals in the UK as opposed to using it for voter registration or whatever which happens in, in other locations. So we were expecting a longer fight um, with all of these kinds of concerns becoming greater such that somebody would just say let's just get rid of all of these we've got so many niggles, so many security breaches, so many people not being happy, so many letters from our constituents so little buy-in from the banks because there's not enough people using it that is not actually, et cetera, et cetera, that let's just quietly kill it off. That's what we were expecting would have been the most likely scenario. The fact that both opposition parties agreed and won and did it, sped it up to, I mean, I had a PhD student who, his PhD was on the role of biometrics and he was finishing off just as the election happened. So his PhD is all talking about the problems of the explanation. And the examiners of his PhD said there's very little in the thesis that would expect it to have stopped for these completely independent, not in the, completely independent, but from these basically straightforward politics, rather as in the party supporting it got voted out of power rather than these kinds of issues that you've been warning that will, will be problematic uh, over time. I'm rambling, I'll stop. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we'll close the session here.
Uh, I'll just say that, you know, uh, the LSE identity project report uh, is yet to have a strong influence in, in, uh, on either journalistic uh, reports on UID uh, project or other academic forms of opinion on UID project. I think it's, it's a serious lacuna, I suppose, uh, in the Indian discourse on Aadhaar that the LSE identity project report has not received the attention that it deserves uh, in, in, in the whole discussion related to Aadhaar. Uh, in that sense, uh, I mean, that's one reason why some of us decided to interview him and his interview uh, appeared in front line in the cover story that he carried in 2011. Uh, I must thank uh, Edgar for coming, uh, giving us this wonderful, fascinating lecture uh, on identity-based infrastructures and looking at it from a societal point of view, not just looking at it from a technical point of view, but also from a societal point of view. I think the lessons learned from the UK experience are central to understanding and analyzing the Aadhaar project in India. The earlier the administrators realize it, the policy makers realize it, the better for them because they'll probably identify the error earlier than later. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>